o'clock, we're all right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Southeast London Chamber of Commerce's webinar with Thackeray Williams. We've got a really exciting lineup today. Um, well, lineup, you know, subject matter. So, legal services for startups. And we have the wonderful um, Dr. Saverio Salandra, and Savvy will be talking to us and giving us all the tips. Um, I'm going to suggest that you, we ask questions at the end and we'll do it in the old fashioned method. Can you use the little yellow electronic hand and ask your question? So over to you, Savvy. Hi, thank you very much um, again for joining us this uh, afternoon for this webinar. Um, I'm uh, Savvy de Savvy. Uh, all people call me Savi, Salandra. I head up the um, corporate and commercial department at the Tucker Williams. We are a full service law firm um, and we are based in uh, London, West Wickham, Seven Oaks and uh, Bromley. As a full service, um, uh, we offer services such as um, will tax and administration, uh, family law, private client dispute, uh, employment law, uh, residential real estate, uh, dispute resolution and, of course, corporate commercial banking and finance. Um, the session today is about um, introducing um, some of the legal services that are needed for a startup company, including contracts and, and everything else around starting your own, your own company. Uh, so we'll start, I think, from, uh, from the beginning. Let's say, first of all, about uh, uh, any kind of business has a different kind of business structure with pro and contra. Now, the common business structure usually are some kind of a sole trader. So a lot of business, basically, they start their business um, as self-employed. Uh, they register with the HMRC. Uh, they keep the profits on the income, of course, as an AI. But uh, in reality, example, opening, the, I don't know, a convenience store, in reality, they are responsible for all the because there is no detachment between uh, the individual and the company. Another common business structure will be like a partnership. Um, usually, again, um, is a kind of sole trader, meet a sole trader, two people or more people, um, they, are, they have some business in common uh, with a view of profit, so by definition, it becomes a partnership. Uh, they are unlimited, they have unlimited and joint and several liability for all the debts and obligation of the company. And that means basically they are not going to stay in any liability in the partnership, but actually can reach also the personal asset, the individual asset of each of them. And um, another way usually is also good uh, because you can become a partnership de facto as far as you have uh, profit um, generating for two people that are making a business in common. Uh, usually it's good to have, if you really want to have that kind of a structure, to have a partnership agreement in place. So for example, you're not going to be subject to the um, standard uh, partnership act, uh, but you are going to have your provision. For example, a partnership, uh, if it doesn't have their own partnership agreement, if one of the partners pass away, then the partner should be dissolved and then the asset and so on. Uh, another common way could be also depends to really from some kind of what kind of business you are in, uh, will be about uh, separate um, limited liability partnership. So usually during the limited liability partnership, um, separation between um, uh, the liability of the company and the amount that was invested by each partner and the personal liability as a member of the company. So you're not going to have that kind of exposure. And that works quite well, for example, for a professional law firm or accountancy firm and uh, brokers, etc. Uh, the most common and um, uh, way to register and structure your business uh, it's through a limited liability company. So basically you create, you incorporate a company uh, through a registration for a company house. Then usually what you have, um, it's a company number. You can decide which one is going to be the capital 
that you are going to the share capital of the company. Example, you can open a company with two people, in two people with uh, two, two pounds. So one pound, uh, the value of each share. So that means that basically the company is going to be exposed only to the share capital of two pounds. So if for whatever reason something is going to happen in the company and the company is not able to afford anymore their liability, uh, you are not going to be liable for your personal asset, but only the company is going to be liable for the asset that they own in the company. That can be a building or everything else that they have in the company until they, they pay the company. They pay the debt. That's so basically the, the fundamental um, business structure that you use. So usually, I mean, uh, every time that you open a company, of course, there is a founders. Then the founders have a lot of uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, especially uh, sometimes, I mean, um, there is already an exit strategy or business plan. So you want to open a company. Uh, maybe your exit strategy will be in five years from now, depending from your industry, sell it to someone else, to another major company or example, create a family business that is going to portray it for a long term. Maybe you want to have a company with another partners. So example, if you have another partners, then there are some kind of um, regulation that will be good to have in place because when you open a company, um, usually through the company house, you receive what is called the model article. That for a sole man, sole business works very well. But if you're going to have a partner, then it will be great to have what is called the shareholder agreement in place and the modified article of association. In that way, at least it's going to be a kind of a Bible for the business and for the shareholder and the director, what can be done, what cannot be done, how it's going to work, example, if someone wants to transfer the share to someone else, or if one of the past may pass away, or if for whatever reason uh, they want to sell to a third party. And so there are a lot of provision, or example, living provision, like a bad good liver, if both partners are working in the company. And then of course you can decide whatever is going to have, um, they are going to have a kind of a director service agreement, uh, how much is going to be the salary, which kind of asset you want to invest. Uh, other things that are, are, are more co most, most common in companies, startups, after a bit, is uh, trying to give some kind of option to the employee, especially to certain employee, try to retain the employee through some kind of option that can be like entrepreneur management investment scheme or other kind of option that are outside there. And you give them some kind of time when they can invest the option, they can be uh, example in connection with the time frame or can be in connection with uh, uh, the EBITDA of the company, so how the company is going to grow. So they're quite flexible depending on your object. Uh, another important thing, of course, I mean, it's like when you have a kid, uh, it's, if you have a kid, it's uh, choosing the, the name, the business name of your company. And that can be quite uh, tricky sometimes. I mean, usually you need to try to create um, to, a, a business name, to come up with a business name that is uh, distinctive, that is unique, uh, that is uh, available. So you need to check in company houses, maybe there is some other business that actually they will be the same name. And then uh, will be great to think a little bit um, had if for whatever reason at one point you would like to uh, <clears throat> to protect the name of the business uh, through example a trademark so you can register uh, the trademark of the business example i don't know as apple did they registered the trademark as a apple and then, then apple is selling computer hardware software etc uh, of course uh, there are different kind of things I and mean, it's not really that simple to register um, a trademark uh, taking consideration example that if you are selling uh, milk you cannot register the trademark call it milk because basically there is no distinctiveness between the name of the company and actually your product so everybody can call his uh, his company or his store milk if they sell milk so there is not really any kind of IP infringement in that case. But if you open a company, you call it milk, and then what you are selling, for example, are clothes, well, then there is a separation between the entities. Uh, and then again, there is, can be also some kind of IP infringement when you choose a name, because maybe it's a kind of a name that is quite similar to someone else. I don't know, example, Paul or Ralph Lauren, and then you're going to call uh, uh, your company Ralph Lauren. Well, then still, I'm sure that um, Paul or Ralph Lauren they already registered a lot of different kinds of trademark to protect themselves. But still, if you're creating some kind of confusion in the market, that can be a risk of um, IP infringement. 
Other things, of course, when you start a company, you already have your company, probably a limited company or an employee, et cetera. You need to start to think about uh, uh, on the day-to-day -day basis, which kind of contract do they need? So the, the, the probably one of the first contracts, apart from the contracts that you have with the shareholders and your partners, is going to be the term and condition of, um, of your business. Uh, why is good to have a term and condition? Because when, whatever is going to be your business, if you're going to sell, uh, uh, provide a service, or if you're going to provide, uh, um, let's say, a product, uh, with a term and condition, it's going to be, you are going to have some kind of click clarity is going to be clear to your customer what are your obligations what is the customer obligation you can limit your risk example based on the fact that um, i'm going to be liable just for the amount of money that you paid myself for an example usually provision that you put in the term and condition are uh, the supplies of the good or the service or the description the customer obligation the um, your obligation, intellectual, intellectual property rights, if there are any kind of intellectual property rights. Uh, very important uh, if you collect data to have a kind of a data protection uh, clause. And of course, how the, 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 the contract is going to be terminated and what are the consequences of the termination of the contract. So these are the basis. But yes, you try to give some kind of consistency to, the, to your term and condition. Other uh, uh, common terms, as I said, in, uh, usually what's very important is about the warranty that you're giving or indemnity that you're giving in um, your term and condition. So you need to try every time uh, to, uh, to, to, to leverage or try like, you know, to balance the risk of the liability. And of course, any kind of insurance that you need to take, take in consideration about the, the kind of business that you are going to do. And the uh, most important thing is also about, I mean, uh, the governing the, the low wage restrictions. So the contract should be, if you're a UK business, should be constructed according with the English law, and you should have exclusive jurisdiction in England. You don't want to end up to have a, a dispute in France, where actually you are not French and probably you need to hire French law, and et cetera, et cetera. So these are a few things that usually you need to check when um, you are. Uh, asking to draft or you are having or you are receiving even a term and condition from a supply because it's vice versa. You have a term and condition for uh, the customer, the same way you're going to receive some term and condition from the supply. So it's good to check all these kind of terms. Other important documents that you have at the start, uh, of course, is going to be some, um, not from a corporate perspective, commercial perspective, but of course, some kind of consultancy or employment agreement that you're going to put in place with the people that works around you. Um, so if you have some kind of idea, if you want to, to disclose a certain information because there is a business purpose, then it's good to have um, an, an, a non-disclosure agreement or also call it confidentiality agreement. Uh, if you also use the service of your website, it's good to have a website term uh, of use, a privacy policy, a cookie policy, if you collect any kind of cookies. Uh, uh, and then again, if you have even an app that is going to be attached to your website, then it's going to have an end user agreement with the user is going to use the app. And, um, other important, depending on from the kind of company that you have, if you think that you are going to purchase, you are not going to grow. Because there are two kinds of, um, of grow in a company. You can grow organically, so through the sell, or inorganically, uh, example, buying some other business that are your competitor, that maybe are smaller business, or maybe are your same size, or for whatever reason, the other people want to retire, you want to take over their business with your business, becoming a subsidiary, integrating with your company. And then what you have is what is called the business purchase agreement that based on the kind of transaction, if you're going to buy the share or the asset of the company can be a shares purchase agreement or an asset purchase agreement. Very complicated document, usually they are around 30, 40 pages, uh, but it's good to check them, to check all the warranty representation and limitation. Uh, if you are the seller, you want to sell your company and you want to sleep uh, in the night uh, with, without thinking about, oh, maybe tomorrow they're going to call me and like, I'm going to be liable for something. Same way for the for the buy, he wants to be sure that he's buying what he was supposed to buy and he doesn't want any kind of liability attached that he didn't know in, a time, in advance. Um, another document that is quite uh, usual uh, between um, uh, 
startup company, especially at the start, are loan agreement. So usually you have some money that are lending by, it can be from banks or it can be between uh, families, family or friends. So you have in place what is called the loan agreement that usually uh, have like, you know, the terms like uh, how much is going to be the interest, uh, the repayment dates, uh, the obligation of each party, uh, if there's going to be any kind of default, acceleration close in case the repayment need to be made uh, earlier or later. And then of course, that kind of agreement can be secured or unsecured. So that means that uh, uh, you can secure a uh, loan agreement through like, um, uh, I don't know, corporate guarantee or some charge of a share or a personal guarantee of the individual that is signing. If it's a company signing, so you get the personal guarantee from the director or can be unsecured. Um, so based on uh, the complexity of, uh, of um, opening a startup, startup company and during the growth of the startup company, because um, of course you, you tend to grow year by year, even if you are um, in a startup mode, you can call yourself in a startup company after three years. Uh, there are different things and different people that you need to, uh, to have around you. And then again, you are going to have different kind of function. Uh, so you need to understand exactly the importance of uh, corporate law or the commercial contract or your responsibility as an employer. So what are the responsibilities to the employees? So employment law is going to be part of it. Intellectual property, if you have some kind of idea that you think it's unique and for whatever reason you want to open, example, a website and you want even to register your trademark, so there is also intellectual property. And then another important thing is also property law, because for sure, when you open a business, you are going to have uh, most of the time, unless um, you deal by online, you are going to have some premises. So it's going to be property law involved because it's going to be there's some kind of, uh, of lease agreement to be signed, unless you're going to buy the property. And other important things, of course, is tax. So um, having a tax lawyer or an accountant uh, that is going to guide you during the process and put in the best position where you're not going to be in default or going to be faulty with the HMRC or also take advantage of different kind of schemes that there are there. If you're uh, opening company like EIS scheme, entrepreneur investment scheme, but actually give the opportunity to um, an investor to invest in the company and there's some kind of tax relief. Uh, and then, of course, you need to be, I mean, apart from everything, uh, the most important thing in the business is, of course, protecting yourself from legal prospect. But, of course, also the cash is king. So you need to have a kind of a cash flow that is going to try to maintain the company alive and try like, you know, to make the company more successful. So that's why it's good to have some kind of, um, uh, of accountant and um, uh, people from, uh, from a business perspective that are going to follow you during uh, this, um, uh, this journey. Uh, why is it good to have this kind of, uh, I mean, sometimes people think that, okay, I'm a startup company right now, I don't need a lawyer, really, I don't need an accountant, I can do my account or I can get people, someone else to do it for me that has some, um, a little bit of expertise to do that. Well, I advise with some step by step, uh, but still to try to work with professional. Uh, it's much easier to avoid risk and um, have the expertise, expert, expertise that they can give you. And it's going to be much easier for them to give you an advice in 20 minutes than for someone else that doesn't know is not an expert in that field or do completely different profession to try to be like um, um, uh, helpful. Uh, and then saves times and saves problems. Uh, it's the same, like, you know, when, uh, I mean, I'm not compared to the same, but it's like, you know, when um, two people get married, they get married with the idea they're going to live for the rest of their life. That happened that when they're going to divorce, uh, then they're lawyering, and then there's a problem, and then they need to think about something, and so on. I mean, the same is when you have a partner, your best friend for life, and you want to open business together, but that, for whatever reason, at one point, maybe, I uh, hope not, but can be that someone is going to have a problem with the other partner. And that's why it's important having a short agreement in place that is going to take in consideration, especially if you are 50-50, like some kind of deadlock uh, provision. And then again, it's going to be like a bubble for your business. It's, it's good to have like some rules when you are with some other partner and know exactly what can be done and how it needs to be done. And not arrive at the point where actually you are saying yes, someone else is saying no, you cannot progress and maybe the only way will be like closing the company and uh, start over in a in different way. 
uh, how Dr. Williams can help you? Well, as I said, we are a full service law firm. So basically, we can help you from, um, as an individual, as a business. In my particular field, uh, I do corporate banking and finance and commercial. So usually, we follow a company if they're merging or they're buying some other company, if they're selling their company. Uh, we, we, we help our client with shareholder agreement or partnership uh, agreement if they need to put in place between one individual, two or three different individuals, maybe joint ventures, maybe two businesses want to create a joint ventures because uh, their, um, uh, their scope is example, purchase, the purchase of a land, the development of a land and so on. So it's good to have a joint venture partnership agreement. Um, we do also, we help also with insolvency or, ins or restructuring of the company. Sometimes a company have too many subsidiary, they want to try to limit the subsidiary. So there is a kind of reorganization of the companies or, or vice versa. They want to, to example, the, to stop the holding company and just keep the only operating company. And then of course, any kind of commercial contracts from the, the start of the company until the, the end of uh, their business life is going to be an end of business life. And that's of course include a commercial contract, uh, term and conditions, uh, uh, franchise agreement, supplier agreement, uh, GDPR policy, website policy, software development agreement, and so on. So this is what we usually do attack the Williams, uh, and uh, I hope I was quite uh, explanative in my, in my session, but uh, please feel free to raise a question if you have one. Thank you, Savvy. Um, can, we, can we see everyone? Lovely. Can we see, can everyone put the camera on? People being modest. No, right. Do we have any questions? Can I see the yellow hands? Lovely. Brian, I kept, I'm going to ask you, have you got anything to say? Because I kept on hearing IT, security, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with everything that's been said, but would it also add um, to the list of experts that are required IT experts? Um, mm. uh, managing your own IT security, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend. I've seen too many times yeah. uh, people uh, being attacked purely because they're not up to, up, you know, up oh. to, um, haven't got the skills, should I say to uh, mm. defeat attacks. Mm. Completely agree. And again, then again, especially depends on the kind of business that you have with. Especially if you are a kind of business that dealing with a lot of uh, data, and especially personal data, it's good to have an IT and uh, some IT consultant or still an outsourcing IT that is going to be ready to like, you know, put some kind of protection in place, some kind mm. of... Um, protection in place is going to understand exactly who's going to be the controller who is going to be the uh, and the producer of the um, uh, of, of the um, of the data and then again yes especially during covid we had um, uh, we have seen a lot of companies that had like some kind of data breach because everyone was online and trying to breach in someone else uh, company mm -hmm. so yeah very important to have an it system and I believe that um, i mean even in uh, the kind of a business uh, you don't need so much of it depends really from the business but if you're doing a business and then again you need just an office a small office uh, with this kind of hybrid work you can work uh, a team of five people uh, example and uh, rotate the three two times a week so the premise is going to be smaller but then you need to invest a little bit more in it because they are going to work from home and they need to work through a platform mm -hmm. Basically, this is a cute platform because you will like not to have any kind of um, breach. And then, example, your data, your um, uh, personal data of your clients are going to be all around the internet. Mm. Great. Yeah. Oh, ah, lovely. I'm squinting slightly. I've, I've got a little screen. Let me just see. I can't because I can't read your name. Gentleman with the earphones on. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my question is, um, say if there was a small startup and it has been running for about a year 
and uh, we got some uh, income cash in the bank. We have not been taking uh, any money out because we just want to keep on growing because there is no need to withdraw any money. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the financial year, we have to do the accounts and submit to, to HMRC. Is it advisable to keep the cash there or is it advisable to take it as dividend? And I do not understand the word dividend, first of all, what that means and how that applies uh, to startups, you know? Yeah, of course, I mean, um, the question that is really more about uh, uh, what is your business plan? Uh, how, what is your, how you are going to invest the money? Mm -hmm. And if you have of, um, of, uh, of plan example to acquire some kind of equipment so uh, yeah. Now, how it works, it works basically whenever you have um, revenue now, and then again, I'm not an accountant, but just to give you an idea. Yeah. Whenever you uh, say so there are some revenue that are coming to your um, company, then of course you have some, um, uh, some uh, payment made to be made that can be yeah. overhead, employment. Yeah. At the end of the day, you are going to have some profit in the company. Yeah. Now, Profit uh, is profit of the company, and then it's going to be probably there's going to be some tax um, connected to the. Yeah. Now, based on that, if you are going to uh, basically withdraw the profit because you are example two shareholder, no, so you are going to withdraw then the net profit of the company, then you're going to be subject to the dividends. So it means that you are going to pay dividends based on your um, on your personal income situation. If you leave the money in the company, then you are not going to subject to pay dividend on a personal level. So a lot of companies tend to leave the money in the company because in that way they don't pay, they don't, they don't basically they don't change their status or at least they are not so yeah. much. Uh, subject to some kind of personal income level. At the same time, they have the cash flow, as we say, cash flow is king, and then you need the working capital, probably they want to expand in different ways. Uh, so it's about opportunity cost. So it's much better for me to have 10,000 and draw down 10,000 in my company, where actually maybe tomorrow I need that 10,000 and maybe I need to go to the bank and maybe the bank is going to apply me. An interest rate is quite high and then they're going to ask me for some personal guarantee or it's better to leave if I can leave and then maybe just draw some part of the cash, example, through a director service agreement where you are going to have an employment service agreement as a director with the company and I don't know, take 8,000, 9,000, whatever it is for, um, for every year. Okay. So it's, uh, it's usually how it works, but I'm not a tax. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more mm -hmm. of an account uh, question towards an accountant, but, but yeah, you. that's yeah. how usually it works. That's why when uh, we create a shareholder agreement, uh, example, other ways uh, creating shareholder agreement in place uh, that uh, have different kind of um, of share. Usually, you have as a share ordinary share. Then you can create a shareholder agreement, an article association, a company that owns different kind of share, I call it alphabetic share. So you have A share, B share, C share, D share. Now you can attach different kind of rights to this share. I mean, so a share can have voting rights, dividend rights, rights to the capital, if it's going to be wind up the company. Another share is going to have some different rights, example, no right to dividends, but still right to capital because maybe you have an investor, et cetera. So that's also a way to classify, to, to make in a different way. And then again, because they are not just a, a denomination of the share, but it's completely different class of share, then you're also able to distribute the dividend to one class of share, but not to the other class and vice versa, based on how much and on their personal situation. Okay. Thank you. So, Isan, I can read your name now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank um, you. Theo, you've got your hand up. Chamber Hello, yeah, brilliant question, my, my Ade San. Um, I wanted to ask, what's the the most important, you know, legal documents to to complete when you when you are launching, registering a company? Yeah, I would say as uh, we were discussing before. I mean, if you are. Um, <laughs> It's like, you know, like your birth certificate or something. So you register your company, you have the model article of association and then you are with your partner. Uh, it's good to have like a model article that is not, as they say, model article, but a bespoke article that is exactly is going to say what's going to happen between us and then supported by a shareholder agreement. Now, 
usually uh, there is like a difference between uh, both document. I mean, to make like a certain, um, just a summary, you know, a company uh, article of association is uh, public, it's available at company house. So everyone can go in company house and see your article association. Um, usually, uh, they include provision like uh, the classes of share, uh, the procedure how to uh, issue, transfer, and transmitted share, how you appoint the power of the directors, how you remove the directors, uh, then other things that you can include in an article of association, example, uh, drag along and tag along rights. For an example, the majority shareholder can force the minority shareholder to sell their share, or vice versa, the minority shareholder can uh, tag to majority shareholder if they're selling the share, if they would want to remain alone in a company with another uh, shareholder that maybe they didn't know. Uh, shareholder agreement is not a public document like the article of association, but it's a private document it's between the parties. So you can go a little bit more in deep. So everything that you can write in the shareholder agreement is between you and the other shareholders. It's a private document. And usually there are example other matters that you can um, address are uh, dividend policy, uh, which kind of uh, um, example um, uh, decision can be done with the consent of the shareholder? Because you can be not a director of a company, but still be a shareholder. I invested some money in a company, but example, I would like that if we are going to lend more than 50,000 to another company, I would like everyone, and not just the director, but to take the decision. So then you can limit certain markets to shareholder content mm -hmm. And put a percentage that can be unanimous or can be 10 or 70 percent. Other things that can be used useful to put also in a shareholder agreement is like a good deliver provision and the bad deliver provision that are closed that uh, usually uh, deal with the employee dismissal and resignation of the employee. And so, based on the fact if they're leaving the company, you can calculate at some price how much is going to be their share, or based on the fact if they're good deliver, it's going to be a market value, fair value, and so on. So yes, there are different kinds of documents, but uh, I would suggest, yes, when you open the company, the first thing is check your beer certificate, is the article association, and try like, you know, to adapt it and have a shareholder agreement in place that essentially is going to reflect exactly what both or the two or the, or the parties, the shareholder, want to achieve from the business and how they want to conduct the business. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Savi. Um, I'm going to um, go to Brian, then Isan next. So, Brian first. You're on mute. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Savi, hi. Um, you hi, mentioned Brian. the privacy policy and um, cookie policy earlier on. What's your uh, many website developers think it's just a box ticking exercise? and will download a template from the internet. What's your opinion of internet downloaded privacy policies? Well, I mean, as I said, I mean, privacy policy and cookie policy are usually depends on the kind of business that you are doing. So you should be aware when uh, you are taking some kind of data from somewhere else, or you are storing some kind of data from someone else, for example, the location or his name or so on. And then they need to accept the privacy policy and they need to accept your term and condition and also your cookie policy. Usually I advise my client to have like some kind of, uh, depends for the structure of the website, but have some kind of terms where basically you need to accept. And then when you accept the terms, uh, inside the terms, there, are, there is also, and they also explain you before you accept the terms that this is our cookie policy. This is our uh, privacy policy, policy. Maybe you need also an acceptable, acceptable user policy. Let's say for whatever reason, you can you have a block. Please. So you can put even some blog that you need to accept uh, so that I can remove your block if it's offending against other members. So they pay from the structure, but it's good to have it. And then again, some website, for example, you can have like accept all the cookies or reject all the cookies because they don't need cookies at all. But some other website, for example, let's say that, uh, I don't know, you need to book a taxi. And then again, they need to know your location, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some kind of um, uh, cookie that actually they need you to accept 
to be able to provide you the service. So it's very, very, very important to have that in place, understand exactly where to put them and how it works, because you don't want to start to collect data before someone gives you permission to do that. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. We're on the same page. Because <laughs> <laughs> everyone will have guessed we have Brian the expert. Brian right, well, it was a good friend. They were all uh, learning. <laughs> I follow a lot of um, um, uh, companies that are like an IT company or uh, they work online, they are creating platform. Uh, and it's very, very important to, to like, you know, follow even the mobile app, the platform, the flowchart, how it works. And exactly, exactly yeah. There is the time when you need to have this accept and where actually they can just go around because you're not collecting any data at all. Yeah, yeah. Before we go into Isan, can I just ask a question, Savvy? Um, you know, in your area of law, um, because it's such as IT and everything associated with it, and you know, cyber technology, everything. Are there lawyers um, that, that are just specialising in this area? In IT. Yeah, uh, there are lawyers that specialize in IT, mm -hmm. so they just way IT, and yeah. uh, still a kind of a corporate commercial matter. But some people, of course, you know, corporate commercial matter. Some people want to specialize in a completely different area. Uh, me personally, I specialize in this kind of IT problem uh, because I, I follow up a lot of company that were startup company some times ago, and then they're not anymore. But yes, we were following all their um, yeah. IT issues. Yeah and the policy GDPR policy example, when there was the boom of the GDPR, uh, I think it was in 2018, everyone needed to do all the and condition. Uh, and we were subject to a lot of different kind of. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So Ethan, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, people can be shareholders without being a director. Can yes. people be directors without being shareholders? Correct. Yes. So in, a, in a small, small company setup. In, in any kind of company, in any kind of company, uh, you can be two people. No, we are two shareholders, and actually we have uh, me. I am the director, and you are just the shareholder of the company. Or vice versa. Example: We are a company of ten people, and I am a director, and then Brian is a director of the company too, but he's not a shareholder. It's the same. Pretty much when you buy some stock in Apple, no, Apple, uh, you, you are a shareholder, you are not director of the company. Mm -hmm. Usually, when the business it's a business that you are creating with some partner, and again, you really need the partner to be involved because if just you need an investment, that's different. You, you can have a silent partner, he doesn't want to be a director, he doesn't want anything, he's going to have an investment agreement in place where he's going to give you some restriction. Example, no, how much money you can spend or what you can do, you cannot do without his consent. If he's a smart investor, most of the investors are smart. But from the other side, maybe you are opening a company with someone, example, because I'm very good uh, in law and you are very good in selling and then we are uh, creating a product that we want to sell to low fat. Now, we need both to be involved because if I'm not going to be there, then you cannot progress and vice versa. And that's why you have a shareholder agreement in place where basically it's going to tell exactly if you're going to be, a, a, an example, any kind of, uh, of uh, employee or officer of the company. If you leave the company before, example, a time frame or for whatever reason, because you want to get another job, how much the value of your share are going to be. Maybe I can pay you the nominal value that is different from the market value. Because I can have a company where the, we have only one under share and the value of the company, the nominal value, it's one pound for each share multiplied by 100, 100 pounds. But the market value may be much more because the company is going very well, et cetera, et cetera. So that's when you can, um, and that's the good and bad lever provision that you can use when you have this kind of small company where both of them are directors and both of them are shareholders. Thank you. Theo, have you got another question? Yeah, just, just one more. So when you're starting up, you're sort of in a phase where you might be looking to, say, get a business loan or acquire some sort of capital from investment. I'm wondering how you sort of go about that, what the sort of green and red flags are there? Uh, 
Well, I mean, there is uh, always there is nothing for nothing. Usually, they said no, they don't give nothing for nothing. But uh, yeah, there are different ways that you can uh, get loan or you can get some seed capital or some money when you start the company. Uh, usually, you get some loan from family and friends, and usually they don't ask any kind of security. So there is a repayment date, and then you need to repay them. Uh, but then again, you need to be able to be very, very attentive to which kind of document you are going to sign. Because if for whatever reason, I mean, we are opening a, a limited company, what we want to do, limited our liability to the company and not to our son, our personal assets. But if for whatever reason, I'm going to get a loan and then between the document I've got to sign, there is also a personal guarantee. Basically, what I'm doing is taking off the shield of, to the liability company and taking basically the liability of me. Because if the company is not going to pay, then the bank can come directly to you because you give the personal guarantee on the obligation of the company and they can come back to you and basically recover the debt from your personal assets. So mm-hmm. if you were trying to accumulate during that period of assets like your home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and at one point you just get a million or two million or three million loan and then whatever reason you're not able to pay and you give a personal guarantee, well, that would be a problem with the personal asset. So always I suggest try to avoid to sign any kind of personal guarantee. I know it's very difficult because if you don't sign a personal guarantee, then the banks are not going to give you the loan. But then again, at least understand the risk. And then again, there are different kinds of security that can be put in place too, like corporate guarantee that are guaranteed given by the company or charge or a share. So try every time to leave the risk until you really need to get on a personal guarantee that is going basically to mm-hmm. take care of the limited liability that you had in place where actually you open your LTD company. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Anyone? Silence. <laughs> Well, uh, I hope everything was very, very clear. That's why there are no questions. <laughs> I think it was very clear. It was, it was very clear. Um, just one point I want to say, and we do have a chamber um, member who has had massive, massive growth. And it was thinking of Isan's point about, you know, not taking any money out. Um, they're hugely successful, but everything um, they're in, accommodation that is sort of meanwhile use. So you haven't got a, a lease you can you know trade with you know the bank uh, these individuals they live in rented a very smart but rented accommodation so they had no massive amounts of cash so they've done so well huge quantities of cash but no actual assets and of course during the lockdown no bank would lend them a penny well, you know, that's why, I mean, sometimes people, I mean, uh, it's a good, not good thing. I mean, at least it's a positive yeah. thing. You forgot yeah. that cash in the company. I mean, that's a good part, at least. It's better than forgetting you don't have cash at all. But yeah. uh, having cash in a company it depends really from your strategy and what you want to do. And uh, again, it's all about an opportunity cost. Now, yeah. if I have... I can be a company, I can be an individual. It's about the opportunity cost, and of course there are risk and rewards. No? So if uh, I put the company, the, the, the bank, uh, the, the money in the bank, I'm going to get maybe one on one thing. Mm. But if to use the money for investing, example, to buy, um, if I have like example, mm. uh, I don't know, in a hotel, and I have one bar, and I actually have a lot of clients, and the waiting time is long. If I can invest 20,000 to create a second bar, and then mm. put and in reality that 20,000 are going to give me as a revenue mm. one ounce. So the return on that investment is much more than just in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Using it. yeah, yeah. So I think we've all got food for thought. <laughs> so definitely no more questions. That'll wait. For yellow hands. No. No. So the butcher's times two. It's been lovely seeing you. Savvy, thank you so much. It's been really, really um, tremendous. And this will be going up on the website. Thank you again. And thank you to Zach Williams. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.